Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Naomi Schaefer Riley, weekly columnist for the New York Post and former Wall Street Journal editor and writer. She's the author of the book, The New Trail of Tears, How Washington is Destroying American Indians. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Naomi. Thanks so much for having me. You're not a Native American yourself, correct? No, I'm not. I'm a member of the uh, the Jewish tribe. Not, ah, it's not a, a, a different tribe, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. But what, what got you interested then in, in writing this book? Well, there are a couple of different things. But um, back when I worked at the Wall Street Journal, uh, I was an editor. And periodically, I would try to commission pieces from other writers on the subject of Native Americans. Um, I would come across a story about you know suicide epidemic or alcoholism. And I really was curious about what was going on. And um, so I typically got two responses from writers. Uh, either they didn't know, uh, or they said, I wouldn't touch that topic with a 10 foot pole. Um, and so you can imagine that sort of, uh, got me even more curious. And in school, we learned that, I mean, there isn't a lot of discussion of this, which I think is why your book is very important. But in school, in school we learn about Native Americans, of course, and we learn that they, uh, were famously abused by the American government, most famously the, the original Trail of Tears, and then put on reservations. And then after that, we don't kind of learn anything. Maybe Wounded Knee and some of the protests in the 60s, but we don't really learn that much about that. How do you think that has affected how we deal with the, the situation on reservations? Well, I think that's certainly true that uh, most Americans don't know much about uh, Native American history, certainly nothing really after the turn of the 20th century. Uh, there was a story I put in my book from a college professor who was about to teach something to her students about American Indians, and she did a poll, and about half of her students apparently thought all Native Americans were dead. So um, I think you know that, that gives you some sense. Um, I think that the fact that we don't have a good sense of this history uh, has kind of led to two things. Um, first, it's a lack of understanding about what a reservation is, which I'll get into in a few minutes. But the other thing I think it's led to is a sense that nothing can be done to help them, that essentially the history of war and forced assimilation that we put on these people um, has kind of rendered them um, you know, helpless in this deeply tragic way. And nothing we can do today will be able to fix this problem. Before we get to what reservations are and the history of them and the, the history of how we got to the fairly negative point we're at today, can you maybe just give us the quick thumbnail sketch of what's bad right now? Like what are things like on these reservations? Yeah, let me just sort of give you a little bit of a depressing statistical rundown. Um, so American Indians are the poorest racial or ethnic group in the United States. Um, some of the reservations I visited had unemployment rates upward of 80 percent. Um, American Indians are more likely than any other group to be involved in gang violence. Uh, their youth are more likely than any other to have alcohol use disorders. Um, suicide is the leading cause of death for Native American boys aged 10 to 14. Uh, Native American women are two and a half times as likely to be sexually assaulted, and Native American children are twice as likely to be abused as the national average. And if you talked to a college professor, a left-wing multicultural college professor, I went to Boulder, so I'm picturing specific, so did Aaron too, specific professors uh, about why that might be the case, you probably would hear something like it's a legacy of what we did to them which seems like a, a sort of damaging narrative that's not very helpful and you push back against that. Right. I think that's definitely the case. It's, it is a narrative of victimhood. It is about what we did to them. And it's not just uh, – Things like putting them on reservations and taking them away from their land, but there are other, uh, you know, points that they often make, especially when you bring up um, the issues of sexual assault and sexual abuse that go on. Um, a lot of them uh, claim that this is the fault of uh, boarding schools. Um, many Indian children were sent away forcibly to boarding schools, which were specifically designed in many cases to force them to give up their language and learn English, um, and also to force them to give up their tribal customs. They also happened in some cases to be hotbeds of uh, you know, sexual abuse and sexual assault. And one of the things that I think probably is true is that the graduates of these schools then went back to these communities and they did not know, you know, how to interact 
uh, in a, you know, in a normal way with other people. And that's probably one of the causes here of some of those statistics. Um, on the other hand, I do think that um, the the boarding schools kind of take a lot of the blame for everything that goes on. Um, and in addition, as you said, it sort of leaves them, it leaves you with nowhere to go. You could say, you know, this is the fault of a history of policies, but then what? Um, is there anything that we can do to help these people get out of their um, tragic situation? And of course, we did do a lot of horrible things, though the boarding schools and, and even more, but, but a lot of your, your book is about how we're continuing to do horrible things to letting them thrive as communities in the form of different policies. So the first one you talk about in the book is private property and essentially the the lack of it, which is which was shocking I mean, as, as a lawyer who does a lot of property rights stuff. Um, of course, I had no idea American Indian law is very complex, but how how bad it is in terms of securing and using property on our reservations. Right. So most people, I think, don't really understand what a reservation is. Um, they, of course, started as a way to simply push American Indians out of our way while we pursued, you know, manifest destiny. Uh, and we specifically, in many cases, chose the least valuable, least fertile land to put them on. What's odd now is that many Americans see reservations as a way of protecting American Indians. In fact, the way the reservation system works is this. Um, American Indians don't own their land. Their land is held in trust by the federal government uh, for them. And as a lawyer, you probably know, uh, the only other people that we hold things in trust for, generally speaking, are children uh, or the mentally incompetent. So I think it's um, pretty shocking in the 21st century that this is the way we even talk about our American Indian policy. But the effect, essentially, of this land trust is that American Indians cannot buy and sell land among themselves without the permission of a bureaucrat in Washington. They can't go into a bank and get a mortgage. Uh, it's funny, people talk about housing shortage on reservations. And if you visit these reservations, they don't look like New York City. I mean, people are not crowded onto these reservations. Um, so why the housing shortage? Because they can't get a mortgage to buy a home. So you have more and more people crowded into temporar temporary trailer homes. Excuse me. Um, and the final problem is that many Americans, if they wanted to start up a small business, uh, use their home and their land as equity in order to do so. But again, American Indians do not have access to that capital. Uh, and finally, they also cannot develop natural resources uh, on their reservation land. It's funny, as I mentioned, originally this land was thought to be inval was thought to be um, unvaluable and infertile, but today uh, much of the country's coal, oil, uh, and natural gas resources are actually located on Indian reservations. So there is this huge amount of untapped wealth on these lands that we do not allow them to develop or that Washington bureaucrats don't allow them to develop. Two questions about the response to this that I think are related. Um, if things are this bad and they don't have the kind of basic legal rights that Americans do off of the reservation and these statistics paint the, the life on the reservations as so overwhelmingly bleak. Um, first, why do we why do we keep these reservations? Why not just privatize, you know, give them the land and call it done? Because we clearly don't need the reservations to, you know, to enable the US government to spread across the land. The manifest destiny is kind of done. Um, and then Relatedly, like if it's if it's that bad, why don't is there something stopping them from leaving? There's lots of places in America that they could move to. So, with the, regard to the first question, um, the reservation arrangement is simply deeply entrenched in American law, and it will be very hard to undo. But right now, I really don't think that there are enough factions that are looking to undo it. So. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the a lot of the American people simply think of reservations as a way to protect American Indians, to make sure that white people don't take their land. Um, and I think a lot of the tribal leadership has actually also bought into this. It's funny the way they talk about how reservation life is so deeply connected to um, preserving tribal language and history and culture. Um, you know, reservations were an invention of white people. And now to talk to the tribal leaders, you would think that if we decided to undo the reservation system, that somehow their culture and language would be in danger. Um, to answer your second question, uh, 
many Indians do leave the reservation. It's, it's certainly not unheard of. But I think that there are a lot of things that are preventing them from leaving. First of all, the people who do leave are the most educated and the most aware of opportunities elsewhere, which leaves, of course, the most vulnerable people behind. Um, But the second thing, I think, is simply the kind of geographic and cultural isolation that many of these communities experience. One of the things I tell people is that during my travels to different Indian communities uh, over the course of about a year and a half, um, I 